Number 10, Luminous. Luminous was actually a pretty cool new villain who seemed to really only be used for one story arc. She was one of the only cool things really to come out of the realization that Wanda and Pietro Maximoff were not actually Magneto's children as we had been led to believe for years. In fact, they weren't even mutants. They were the product of the high evolutionary's experimentation, which fit more in line with their origins in the MCU, which I guess is why we changed that. No, I'm not mad about it. Not at all. It turns out the High Evolutionary had also used their genetic material to create a sister for them both, known as Luminous. She possessed both the chaos magic reality warping powers of Scarlet Witch, as well as the super speed of Quicksilver, and was originally ordered by her father, the High Evolutionary, to kill her genetic siblings. She tried. She tried real hard. Number 9. Pets of Evil Masters While the Pets of Evil Masters might not be the most impactful villains around, they are definitely some of the most adorable. These villains obviously seek to thwart the pet Pet Avengers, the pets of Earth's most mightiest heroes. Like their heroic opponents, the pets of evil masters are exactly what they sound like, the pets of some of the most vile villains in the Marvel Universe. They are led by Doctor Doom's pet Vulture, Vulture Von Doom, and include Thori, Loki's Hellhound, and Bitey McSpidey Bite, who isn't stated to be owned by any specific villain, but is implied to be the spider that was responsible for creating Spider-Man. On Earth 616, that spider may have died, but on Earth 97161, where the pets of evil masters are from, I guess that little spider lives on, seeking to wreak all kinds of havoc. And before we move on to this next part, just a quick thank you to you for sticking around watching this video. And if you haven't already, something that helps us out a ton here at the channel is clicking that like button. So do it. Click the like button. And if you did already, thank you so much for doing so, it really helps us out. Number 8. Null While Null did first appear as a mysterious being in Thor God of Thunder issue number 6 in 2013, he wouldn't receive a full appearance with more exploration and embellishment in terms of his history until the summer of 2018. Now Null has become such a big figure that he is threatening not just Venom's existence but the existence of all of Earth's heroes with the King in Black event that is slated to start in December. Null has come a long way since that first mysterious appearance and it's likely he's going to aim to go even further to guarantee his place in the Marvel history books and lore for years to come. Number 7. Immortal Abomination Immortal Abomination is the devastating monster that first appeared in Immortal Hulk issue 18. He appears to be genetic material belonging to Emil Blonsky, spliced with that of Rick Jones, which gives us a really messed up version of Rick with two heads in a monster body. This version of Rick Jones and Abomination is also referred to as Subject B. Eventually he was put down later on in Immortal Hulk, but he is a horrifying power powerful and emotionally painful creature for the Hulk to come up against, especially considering how close he and Rick Jones were. This version of Abomination, it should be noted, is different from the Abomination that we later come to know originally as General Reginald Fortian. The General Fortian version of Abomination first appeared in issue 19 of the Immortal Hulk series. Number 6. Ultimatum Ultimatum is basically Dark Miles Morales from Earth 616. He grew up as part of the Rigoletto crime family and later in his life ended up serving time in prison in place of his cousin. Although Miles Morales aka Spider-Man has basically been moved to the prime universe of Earth 616 and made it his new home, following the destruction of his original universe, the ultimate universe of Earth 1610 and the incursions, there was another Miles Morales who originally was from the main continuity, from Earth 616. We'll call him 616 Miles Morales, try to make this less confusing for you. That Miles Morales of Earth 616 became a villain, working in league with Kingpin aka Wilson Fisk. 616 Miles has a scarred face and ends up becoming the villain known as Ultimatum. 616 Miles actually took that villain alias of Ultimatum and was planning on trying to send 1610 Miles, Spider-Man, back to his original universe and take over Brooklyn in the ongoing comic series Miles Morales, Spider-Man. He was momentarily stopped however by Spider-Man himself and Prowler who escaped his clutches. Miles versus Miles, who wins? Too many Miles! Just kidding, you can never have too many Miles Morales in my opinion. Number 5. Black Winter Black Winter was actually an old villain sort of made new and shiny again. Originally we came to know this cosmic evil constant as the Creeping Plague, although I do like the name Black Winter better. <laughs> And creeping plague. It was credited with being the entity responsible for the death of the cosmos prior to its rebirth when Galen was first transformed into the being known as Galactus. The Black Winter was meant to be this massive, unstoppable, eldritch villain, though shortly after its full appearance in Thor issue number 4 from 2020, it was swiftly defeated two issues later. It's not so unstoppable. Though it did require the power of Galactus, which Thor wielded in order to destroy the Black Winter, getting a brief glimpse of his possibly perilous future in its last 
falling snowflake. So yeah, it did require a lot of power, I guess, to take it out, but still, it was only two issues. <laughs> they were like, this thing, it's massive, and defeated, no props. Oh yeah, the Black Winter is also kind of like an eldritch storm that basically erases the existence of all it comes into contact with, and it comes with bonus visions of your own destruction. Number four, Xeno. Xeno is a mutant terrorist group who is composed of others from previous mutant hate groups. The idea is all those mutant hate groups have now unified like the mutants themselves, becoming this new group known as Xeno, which was written to be a play on the word xenophobia. Xeno managed to capture a mutant domino and use her skin to mask their own soldiers as mutants so that they could infiltrate Krakoa and massacre as many mutants as possible before the alarm sounded in the mutant nation. During their first appearance, they managed to assassinate mutant leader Charles Xavier. Though fortunately, Charles was able to be resurrected following this instance and Krakoa covered up the successful assassination to make it seem as though he was never killed in the first place. Cause you know, you can't let other world leaders know that your world leader was assassinated. That's uh, it's not so good. Number three, Mutant Trauma Support Group. The Mutant Trauma Support Group is a new group with an age old message to deliver to all humans who hate mutants. You are not alone. The group offers support without judgment to those who have been wronged or felt like they have been wronged by mutants. They offer no judgment, only support. No hate speech or degrading comments are allowed in the community unless directed towards mutants. The group appears to have all their revenge missions and anti-mutant gatherings organized via an online community, possibly via a social media channel or some kind of exclusive forum. They first appeared in 2020's Wolverine in issue number 4 where they targeted, you guessed it, Wolverine. Although they had their plans of vengeance cut short by an unexpected guest, it's likely that there are many more members of the group that we could run into in the future. Number 2, Annihilation. Annihilation is a dark god who possesses those who wear their golden mask. Whoever so possesses their mask is overtaken by the dark entity within it and depending on their own strength is often destroyed by the sheer power of the god and mask itself. It is believed to be the spirit of Amenth manifested and is also linked to the control and rule over the Amenthi demons. Without anyone wearing the mask to rule them, the Amenthi demons are revealed to be destructive and reckless, destroying anything and everything they can get their hands on without any need for a reason. The shocking revelation of Annihilation's current true identity was recently revealed in the current X-Men run in issue 14. No spoilers for anyone who isn't caught up. Number 1. Kang. Kang the Conqueror is believed to be coming to the MCU in this next cinematic phase. So while he might not be a new villain in terms of the comics, in terms of the MCU he's going to be one of the freshest we've seen. Once he shows up that is, in Ant-Man 3, which is expected to release in 2022. Woo! 2022, that's a long way away. It is believed that the brilliant Jonathan Majors will be playing Kang, or at least one form of him, and that he'll be showing up in Ant-Man 3. And that's according to the Ant-Man 3 IMDB page. It's right on there if you look at it. The cool thing with Kang, however, is that he's a time-traveling villain who, as a result, has been known by many different identities and aliases throughout his history. So while Jonathan Majors may be playing one version of him, there might be other actors also playing Kang. The weird thing, though, with Kang is that he's a time traveling villain who as a result has been known by many different identities and aliases. So yeah, it could be great or it could be really confusing. We've known him as a Mortis, Ramatut, and even at one point as Iron Lad. It'll be interesting to see how Marvel and Disney aim to integrate Kang and what this means for not just the main continuity but the potential multiverse within the MCU. So many great and bizarre new villains and reinvented villains coming your way. I don't even know what to think of Kang coming to the MCU, that just seems so strange. But I also feel like sometimes the strangest choices are the best. Also, we're getting Jonathan Majors, so I feel really good about that. I guess only time will tell how that will go. Number 10, Kid Omega. Kid Omega, aka Quentin Quire, has also been described as an Omega level telepath and telekinetic before. He joined up with the Xavier Institute later in the new X Men series in issue 134. Quickly, Quentin became a prized student of Xavier's, who saw within him a great potential, as brilliant and as talented as he was. However, over time and with the revelation, that he had been adopted, he became more rebellious and egotistical. He questioned Professor X and the professor's dream for the world, for humans and mutant kind to coexist in harmony. He began using the mutant drug Kick and created a gang called the Omega Gang, which set out attacking humans. Eventually, he was beaten down by the Stepford Cuckoos and he reformed. Though he would continue to be known for having a bit of an attitude and a rebellious streak. But hey, isn't that why we love him? Or is that why we hate him? I don't know. You tell me. You be the judge. 
Quentin Choir, love or hate. Number nine, Prodigy. Prodigy is Dave and Elaine, a mutant who is often associated with the X Men and who attended the Xavier Institute. He came to the famous mutant school after trying to hide his powers. David has always been a smart kid, but he started noticing one day that he knew things that he simply just couldn't have known and that he didn't remember learning. It turned out that David had been telepathically absorbing knowledge and skill sets from the minds of those around him. Feeling bad about his ability, like it gave him an unfair edge and meant he was kind of cheating, he sought to hide it and double down on studying to improve his knowledge naturally. Unfortunately, the mutant hate group Purity ended up uncovering a secret and outing him as a mutant, causing him to turn to the Xavier Institute. He would lose his abilities on M Day, but still remain a valuable hero with all of the knowledge he retained later becoming fully accessible to him again. Being a mutant with studious telepathic abilities, I also love that he was originally depicted as needing glasses. Though of course, in a land of magic and superpowers, he was later cured of his need for corrective lenses by mutant elixir. Number 8. Elixir Josh Foley is an omega level mutant. He found himself at the Xavier Institute after being rejected by his friends and his family because of his mutant status. Sad face. Originally, he was part of the anti mutant group, the Reavers, but discovered during a fight with some mutant students that he actually was a mutant himself with healing abilities, which he used to heal one of the fellow Reavers who was injured in the fight. He tried to hide his powers as long as he could, but eventually he got found out and outed. His powers allow him to manipulate the biological structure of organic matter within a certain proximity to him. He can use these powers to heal or to harm others, and is also able to sense one's life energy and even transfer life energy from one being to another. For seal ability. Most recently, we saw him in the House of X as a member of the Five, a group of mutants whose powers, when joined together, allow them to resurrect other fallen mutants. He made his first appearance in New Mutants Volume 2. Number 7, Abigail Brand. Abigail Brand was created by John Cassidy and Joss Whedon and made her comic book debut in Astonishing X Men Volume 3. She is a no nonsense badass who is half mutant and half alien, one of the first to show us that even those with alien heritage can also be mutant too. Brand is best known in affiliation with Sword. A division of S.H.I.E.L.D. that seeks to guard the world against and deal with extraterrestrial threats. SWORD stands for Sentient World Observation and Response Department, in case you didn't know. And Bran serves as the commander of the organization, the head of the organization, if you will. Her mutant power is Contact Pyrokinesis. She can produce blue or red flames on her hands and use those to burn through almost anything or anyone that gets in her way. So watch out for Abigail Brand. She'll mess you up. Number 6, Oya. Despite making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men, the original X-Men series, Idye still didn't end up joining the group until 2010. Yeah, that original series went on for a long time. Idye made her first appearance in issue 528. Idye's powers involve thermal manipulation. She can convert thermal energy into extreme hot or extreme cold, but she does need thermal energy in order to be able to do this. She can't just like create flames or ice on her own. Idye was discovered by the X-Men through Cerebra. When her power was activated, she accidentally killed her family by burning down her village in Oyo State, Nigeria. The military showed up seeking to stop and destroy her, but Hope and Storm rescued her. Yay! Number five, Brew. Oh my goodness, I love Brew so much. I love Brew too much. Calm down, Amanda. So, Brew has to be one of the cutest mutants on this list, just FYI. Brew is a mutant and a member of the Brood alien race. Brood are typically born with an urge to kill and consume. They do not understand compassion and empathy in the same way that humans do. But Brew was born with compassion, which actually made him a mutant of the race and also helped him to become independent, separating himself from the hive mind and developing his own sense of self with the ability to make his own decisions. Well, you might not think of compassion as a mutant ability, for the Brood, it very much is. In fact, when young brood are born with such mutations, they are usually deemed as a reject and killed. But due to the dwindling population of the brood, the brood queen allowed brood to live. He studied at Jean Grey's mutant school for higher learning. And he guys wears a cute little suit. It's so cute. Never thought brood could be as cute, but there you go. There you have it. Anything is possible if you believe. Number four, Genesis. Genesis was created by Phantom X using the World, a research facility created by the Weapon Plus program, which had been shrunken down to portable size. Think Hank Pym's Lil Quantum Lab, the Ant Man and the Wasp MCU film, but smaller than that. Genesis, aka Evan Sabineur, is the clone of Young Apocalypse. Phantom X created Evan to help overthrow Angel, who had become Apocalypse's horseman of death and sought to replace him. Evan was raised to be basically a good version of Apocalypse, what the X Men villain would be like as a hero, if you will. Evan has already shown that he possesses some of the original Apocalypse's powers and abilities, including super strength and durability, matter manipulation, and energy manipulation. And it is likely that as he grows, he will develop even more of his abilities. Probably. Possibly. We'll see what happens. Number three, Sprite. 
Not to be confused with the Eternal Sprite, this sprite is also known as Jiu Jing. In fact, she got her codename from Wolverine, who gave it to her in reference to not the Eternal Sprite, but to Kitty Pride, who actually once went by the same codename. Upon having her mutant abilities manifest, Jiu became determined to become the greatest X Men. Ever, to honor her family and her country, China. Gia's mutant abilities are tied to her appearance. She has wings and resembles a fairy. Her skin is also durable and rock like, and her body is somewhat morphable. Number 2 Shark Girl Shark Girl was originally Ayara Dos Santos, a young girl from Brazil who one day noticed an intense craving to eat fish. This was the first sign of her powers manifesting, which eventually resulted in her becoming a mutant aware shark. She ended up enrolling in the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning, but takes weekends off to return to her home in Brazil. Her powers allow her to resemble a shark while maintaining her own mind and memories, and not resemble a shark to the point that, you know, she can't walk. She is more of a, a land shark usually, part humanoid, still able to stand and walk around on her legs and also use her hands. This form also enhances her physiology, giving her increased strength and speed, and allowing her to breathe both underwater and on land. She was already a great swimmer, but her mutant powers enhance her ability even more. While in her shark form, however, she is also susceptible to going into a blood frenzy, like most sharks are occasionally known to do. So whatever you do, don't bleed around her. She might try to eat you. It's not her fault. Number one, Amy. That's right, her name's just Amy. <laughs> And we're going to finish it off with a sob story to remind us of all the mutants we have both gained and lost over the years. Though with the five existing in House slash Powers of X, maybe we'll get all those lost mutants back eventually, at some point, unless things change. We'll see. Amy was a mutant who was trapped in the Red Skull's concentration cap on Genosha. She made her first appearance in Magneto Volume 3, Issue Number 9. Amy had illusion based powers that became warped after suffering the horrors of the camp. When Magneto freed her, these powers started wreaking havoc. She ended up creating monsters and nightmares from others' fears and haunted psyches. Amy's powers allow her to create 3D constructs, and when these nightmarish constructs started to kill, it became apparent that either her or those whose nightmares she possessed needed to die in order to put a stop to her malfunctioning powers. Amy, being the angel that she is, decided to sacrifice herself, not finding much reason to live anyways as tortured as she was. Poor Amy. Oh, she didn't even last 10 issues. I just feel really bad for her. No. Number 10, Tempest. Eva Bell first made her appearance in all new X-Men issue number one in 2013. She could be viewed as one of the most useful of the new mutants to surface in the past decade. Because her abilities are so based in something that the X-Men and mutants and well, sort of all of Marvel seem to get involved with more often these days. Time travel. Tempest has chronokinesis powers, which allow her to alter the way time moves around her in the area she is in, and allow her to create time bubbles which she can send through time for a short while, and even time travel fully herself. She has been referred to as near Omega level, and honestly with a bit more control over her powers, I could see her making the Omega list any day. Tempest is also one of the house of X's The Five, and helps to bring deceased mutants back to life by speeding up the growth process within their eggs. It sounds creepy when I say it like that, but more will be explained. Number 9, Morph. I really like this mutant because with him they found a way to make shape shifting abilities unique again, and somehow make them even weirder and cooler at the same time. Morph, aka Benjamin Deeds, is able to shape shift into those he spends time with, slowly, over time. So the more time he spends with you, the more he starts to resemble you. He really is the embodiment of what it feels like to live in somebody else's shoes. As he fuses with you, he takes on your look, your voice, and also exudes an energy that encourages you to trust him, to feel relaxed and calm in his presence. I just think this is such a cute way to imagine shape shifting and a useful way to use it as well. Potentially calming your target into submission as opposed to causing them harm. It's kind of like the anti-mystique of shapeshifting, I think. Number 8, Gold Balls. Gold Balls recently became a very important mutant in the comics. He is part of a group known simply as The Five on Krakoa. Together he and Proteus, Elixir, Hope Summers, and Eva Bell can help to bring forth new life, or well, sort of old life really. They are able to resurrect any mutants who have been lost by cloning them and with the help of X, restoring their previous memories so that in essence, they kind of are the lost mutant returned. Gold Balls power is similar to Minoru Mineta of My Hero Academia. Instead however, Fabio Medina produces Gold Balls. Hence his name. Originally, these were simply seen as balls of various sizes, which could be launched in a sort of an attack mode. Later, it was discovered that they were actually infertile eggs, and with the help of the five, would become the home of unborn, resurrected mutants who had fallen. Gold Balls made his first appearance in Uncanny X Men Volume Three, Issue Number One. Number 7, Ellie Camacho. Eleanor is the daughter of Deadpool and Carmelita Karma Camacho. That's right, Deadpool is a daughter. 
if you can believe it. Carmelita and Deadpool were being held hostage together and fearing that she would die. Carmelita decided she wanted her last acts to be those of love. Her and Deadpool were rescued right in the middle of this act of love, but he still managed to get her pregnant. She initially raised baby Ellie on her own, but did track down Deadpool to at least get him to recognize his daughter and take some responsibility. That was during the time that he was actually working for Butler and constantly having his mind wiped. Butler saw the child as an opportunity and before Deadpool could scare off Carmelita and baby Ellie, took a blood sample from the baby. This happened in Deadpool Volume 3, Issue 34 out of 2013. And in this issue, we learned that the results of that blood test proved that Ellie had an active X gene, meaning she was a mutant who would one day grow up to manifest powers. We don't know what they are yet, but I'm sure they're going to be amazing. Also, she's a mutant, so cool. Number 6. Nature Girl Nature Girl was given her name by iBoy. The two mutants also went on a bit of an adventure together while babysitting Jubilee's adopted son, Shogo. And the two were both a part of Jubilee's team of mutants to train at Kitty Pride's Xavier Institute for Mutant Education and Outreach in Central Park. They are also really cute together, with iBoy being covered in eyes and Lin with her little antlers being a master of nature. Lin Lee aka Nature Girl's powers consist of an ability to bend nature to her will and communicate with it. She is able to soothe beasts, can control the elements, and can even heal nature. Truly the mutant we could all use right now, am I right? Come on, heal this, heal this terrible earth that we have destroyed. Lin Lee was also a student at the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Number 5. Matthew Malloy One of the most powerful mutants who kind of no longer exists, but he could still exist I guess if writers decided to bring him back. He was basically written out of existence when Tempest went back in time and prevented his parents from ever meeting, meaning he was never conceived and therefore did not exist in present day. This had to happen because Malloy proved too strong and unstable with his powers being strongly linked to his emotions. He emitted a blast of energy that ended up destroying most of Atlanta. He also has strong reality warping powers, telekinesis and telepathy. He could also even manipulate matter. It was even suggested that he was beyond Omega level in the comics, so although writers have written him out, I wouldn't be surprised at his power level if he didn't find a way to return to the comics. He didn't even make it to 10 issues in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3. Still, he demonstrated such power that I feel he's really worth mentioning. You know, we might see him again someday, who knows? Number 4. Sapna While Sapna may have only existed in corporal form for only a short time in the comics, it's possible she could actually live on forever in Magic Soul Sword. Sapna was a young mutant girl who appeared to have magical powers at first. This intrigued Magic who wanted to know the extent of the young mutant's powers and so took her to see Doctor Strange. It turned out that she actually had language based powers, but because her powers manifested while she was in limbo, this caused her to absorb all of the magical and demonic knowledge of that realm meaning that she could control demons and open gateways to other realms and dimensions. Magic was attempting to train her when Sabna had visions of doing harm to Magic and that made her run away. The being that offered her help only wanted to use her and Magic was forced to kill Sabna with her soul sword. However, this also preserved Sabna's soul within it, allowing her to live on in spirit, sort of. So she's like dead, but she's still she's in her soul sword, so you know, lives on in a sword. Sounds boring. Number 3. Bailey Hoskins Bailey is a mutant I wish we got to see more of. He is the star of the one-off, non-canon comic series X-Men Worst X-Man Ever. I say non-canon lightly because this is Marvel we're talking about, so everything is kind of canon, just living in an alternate reality. Bailey currently resides in a reality which isn't really quite established, temporarily suggested to be the alternate reality of 656, a placeholder for now. Bailey's mutant ability is self-detonation, which he can regrettably only use once as he has no resurrection or healing powers to protect him. Well you might think that makes him the worst X-Man ever, I would argue it is the one he chooses to use that power on and stand up against that is actually the worst in that comic series, the vile fascist mutant leader Riches. Number 2. Hindsight While Nathaniel Carver might not appear to have the strongest power just yet, I'm certain like most underrated powers that with more control over his abilities, he could prove to be more useful than originally anticipated. Nathaniel aka Hindsight has the ability to see one's recent past upon making physical contact with them. He can also use this ability on objects allowing him to see any psychic imprints left behind on that object, a power that Jean Grey actually also has. But one of my favorite things about Nathaniel was his fear of these powers getting in the way of a relationship that he started developing with fellow student Benji aka Benjamin Deeds aka Mork who I mentioned earlier. Fortunately love overcame fear and the two ended up together and are admittedly adorable together. Yay! Future gay x-men bring them on I'm ready. Give me all the gay x-men. 
Number 1. Moira McTaggart One amazing revelation we got from the House of X Powers of X series was the truth behind Moira McTaggart. Moira has always been painted as an ally to the X-Men, but in House of X we found out what really drew her to their cause. Although Moira has been a long standing character in the comics first appearing in 1975, it wasn't until recently that we discovered she was a mutant. Dun dun dun. It turns out that her power is to live her life again, allowing her to see the different outcomes of different futures and allowing her to effectively alter her own fate as well as the worlds with her life choices. Her resurrection power is an odd one, and Destiny confessed to Moira that she only saw her living a maximum of 11 lives. If she played her cards right. Still, when used correctly, it would appear to be a powerful mutant ability, as you see in House of X. If, if you read it, if you haven't read it, what are you doing? Get out of here. Go read it. Kicking off the list at number 10, Dawn of the Dead. Making his first appearance in Taskmaster Volume 2, Issue 2. Okay, right off the bat, this guy rocks. I mean, look at this dude's style. Come on, he knows he's popping. He's a former S.H.I.E.L.D. operative, and while he was a military advisor to the Mexican Armed Forces, he had met Taskmaster. Now, after he had left S.H.I.E.L.D., he got this amazing new persona, Dawn. D-O-N of the dead, which is my new favorite name for any villain ever. That's it. He pretends to be Mexican and was elected a governor in Western Mexico. It was there that he was trained by Taskmaster, and now he's the leader of his very own cartel that focuses on methamphetamine. Nice. So this is a wild villain. Every panel of this guy is super flashy and very dramatic. Of course. He's also quite the performer. In his first issue, you see him addressing a crowd of Hannah Montana wannabes, saying that this is what real narcos sounds like. Again, the guy from S.H.I.E.L.D. pretending to be Mexican. Awesome. Duly noted. And before we move on with our list, guys, if you could just go ahead and toss us a thumbs up because, you know, it helps us a lot here at the studio. And thank you very much to everyone that has already done that. Thank you. Number 9, Macho Gomez. Macho shows up as a random villain to Deadpool in issue 32 of his 2008 series. He is basically an alien hitman who thinks he's the best. Definitely better than the earthbound merc with a mouth, Deadpool. In reality, he proves to not be as great as he thought he was. Deadpool makes quick work of him and then ends up going on a space adventure to get paid and to prove his mettle to the galaxy and the universe. This prompts an epic space opera arc where Deadpool takes over Macho's life, taking his former job and even marrying his widow. Number 8, The Builders. The oldest race in the universe and they actually consider themselves perfect beings. Okay, wow, we're gonna go there, eh? I see you. Yeah, okay, you're perfect, sweet. Beyonce and The Builders. Man, that's a tough one, here we go. They're so perfect, I mean, how do we pick between the two, you know? They worship the mother maker herself, the universe. The Builders created these aggressive systems to direct, shape, and control the very structure of space and time. So they think they're the sh There are two types of Builders, the Creators and Bob the Builders. No, 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 there's Creators and then the Engineers. They seeded worlds for billions of years and directed the evolution of civilization. I mean, I get it. You're cool, you're old, you think y'all are the best. You're not perfect though, okay? Spoiler alert, you look like bugs. Huh. You guys look like Ultron if he was covered in cow sh Number 7, Hydra Supreme. Hydra Supreme was the name Captain America took when he became evil. He only became evil, of course, because Kobik, the cosmic cube in the form of a little girl, altered reality to make him a secret sleeper agent for Hydra throughout his history. Reality was then changed so that every action Captain America, Steve Rogers, had taken up to this point was all part of a long con to take over the United States of America after gaining their trust implicitly before revealing his true colors. Fortunately, the original Captain America still existed within the Cosmic Cube, or the shards of it, and once released was able to fight against and defeat his evil alternate reality counterpart. Woohoo! But also not woohoo if you were a fan of Hydra Supreme. Number 6, Deadpool Core. Making their debut in 2010, Deadpool Core are, well, they're a team of Deadpools, as you would have guessed. Their first issue, prelude to Deadpool Core issue 1, they are founded by Earth 616 Deadpool after the Contemplator chose him to be the one to stop this cosmic entity, the Awareness. Super aware. The awareness does this really neat thing where uh, mm. it devours the multiverse consciousness. Awesome. The Deadpool core have a unique mind that makes them immune to it. And they ride in style using the B Arthur as means of transportation. Which is not a bad ride at all. I mean, I'd pull up with that. Let's go. The Deadpool core joined forces after Dreadpool formed an evil version of the core that, of course, had out to, you know, massacre every version of himself in the multiverse. And the Deadpool core were short lived, but as usual, a lot of bloody. 
I need to discuss them. Number five, Assessor. Assessor is an AI who is working in tandem with Ultimatum, or more specifically, working for him. For those who don't know, Ultimatum is basically like Evil Miles Morales, who was the Miles of the main continuity of Earth 616 originally. If you want to learn more about him, we actually talked about him in part two of this list series, so you can go back and check that out. Assessor, as a villain, is basically like a humanoid appearing Gladys from the Portal video game series. They had heroic Miles Morales brought to a testing center where they could run tests to gain in depth information on his powers, threatening to harm his family members if he did not cooperate. Assessor does not appear to have any human emotions and only allowed Miles to escape after they were satisfied with the information they had already procured from the tests. It's unknown who created Assessor or where exactly they come from. It's all very mysterious. Number four, Detroit Steel. Making his debut in Invincible Iron Man Volume 2, Issue 25, we have another big badass suit guy, Doug Johnson III a former army soldier who ended up working for Hammer Industries. He was the pilot rocking the big bad America suit. Everybody had thought that Doug was dead. And usually when this happens, it's either awful or it works out in your favor. I know from experience, you know? So Mock, breaker of faith, turned him into stone during conflict. Then when good guy Odin restored everybody, he was of course one of them. His family, the army and Hammer Industries still thought that he was dead though. So he decided to use this in his favor. He got his passport, returned to America, and kidnapped Sasha Hammer in order to get the Detroit steel armor back in his hands. Justine Hammer was on board with this whole plan. Obviously, she was going to blow up the armor as soon as she got the chance, right? Well, Dougie Johnny III was already way ahead of the game. He had hacked Hammer's systems earlier so that it had no effect on him, which is not a bad idea at all. Number three, Iska the Unbeaten. Iska is the sister of Genesis, and as such is Apocalypse's sister-in-law. She is a mutant from Morocco who is fighting against our mutant heroes of Krakoa in the Otherworld Tournament, intended to settle their dispute as decided by Opal Luna Saturnine, the Omniversal Magistrix of the Starlight Citadel, as seen in the current X-Men event, Ten of Swords. Iska's mutant power is an epic one. She can never be beaten. Krakoan mutants, Magic and Cable, both set to testing her power prior to the tournament's start at a great feast that was held the evening before, finding them to be quite impressive. They wondered what would happen if she were to face their lucky friend Domino, and Iska assured them that whoever this Domino was, she would certainly lose. And I gotta say, after seeing Iska go to work, I think I would agree Iska's gonna probably win in a fight against Domino. Let me know what you think about that. Number two, Evil Deadpool. Making his first appearance in Deadpool Volume 2, Issue 44, Evil Deadpool is somebody I think we're gonna see pretty shortly on the big screen. Yes, of course, I have a theory here. Mm -hmm. So the origins of Evil Deadpool are pretty wild. So Ella Whitby, who we all remember as the British psychiatrist who's obsessed with the loudmouth, but just how obsessed you ask? Well, I mean, she collects body parts from Wade Wilson and then leaves them in her freezer right next to the ice packs and frozen pizzas, of course. So when Deadpool found this cool box of yuck, he tossed the parts in a dumpster. Now, Wade's healing factor is so good. How good is it, Taylor? <laughs> well, they all formed together and grew back. Ugh, imagine the smell. He ended up stealing Stealing a private jet and traveled to the States, where he ran into his other half, literally. The tiny legs part in Deadpool 2 was great and super funny, but what's up with his second half? Are they growing another Deadpool? I sure hope so. The evil twin thing seems to be working well. We'll watch a thousand of those all day, every day. Number one, Solemn. Solemn is one of the champions fighting on the side of Arako during the Ten of Swords event. Initially, we were introduced to him in 2020's Wolverine in issue six, where he appeared as the perfect match for Wolverine. But although we've seen them dance around one another and even team up to take on a demon horde in hell, we still have yet to see these two battle one another. The reason why they seem so appropriately matched, Solemn is an Iraqi mutant with adamantium skin, meaning he, in comparison to Wolverine's adamantium skeleton, is on the same level of durability. As far as we know, no, he doesn't possess Wolverine's advanced healing factor though, but he is known for being a smooth talker and both himself and Wolverine each possess a Muramasa blade, meaning that they would be easily able to slice each other up with their swords. Cause you know, Muramasa cut through anything. Also take your powers away. Number 10, I boy. While Trevor Hawkins may seem like an absurd mutant all covered in eyes and whatnot, I wouldn't write him off just yet. His mutation revealed itself following the events of the Avengers vs X-Men. He has died multiple times since his introduction in the Wolverine and the X-Men series, but he always keeps randomly coming back. As I said, you might think his death has occurred so many times because his abilities could be deemed as lame. What use is being covered in eyeballs? Sounds more inconvenient than anything. But his multiple eyes have actually granted Trevor some pretty cool powers. For one, he's been shown to be able to 
use his eyes and the multiple perceptions from them in target practice, making him a really proficient marksman. His improved vision also allows him to be better at reading people's nonverbal cues, giving him greater insight into those people that he interacts with. People or mutants. This also translates into battle by giving him enhanced perception when it comes to an incoming attack, being able to tell when someone is about to pull a punch, etc., etc. And of course, his eyes also allow him to see on both a microscopic and a telescopic level, meaning he can see a little speck of dust or see clearly something that is quite far, far away. If you're wondering why I looked over there, I was looking far, far away. That's me trying to have telescopic vision. It's not working. Number nine, triage. Triage made his first appearance in the all new X-Men series. His powers involve life force control over other beings, and for a while some believed his powers also granted Christopher Mew's immortality. However, Christopher appears to have died after being forcibly cured of his mutation, which in itself ended up killing him. With his powers, Triage was able to heal others and could even reanimate corpses, though their state of decay would remain unchanged. And if he had been granted more time, who knows, he may have even been able to completely heal and resurrect people, restoring them to a more mm, lively and maybe less zombie-like appearance. Too bad he died. Although is he dead? Is he not dead? Was he immortal? I don't know. Stay tuned to find out more. Number 8. Hijack David Bond was first introduced in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3. He was revealed to be a technopath with a proficiency for controlling cars with his mind. He could start an engine, unlock and open doors, and make them drive around. A pretty sexy power in my opinion. But then again, I have an affinity for cars because I'm a weirdo. After David discovered his powers, he went to parking lots at night to test them out, but ended up being caught by the local police. At the time, his girlfriend Karen was with him. Terrified, she actually outed David as a mutant, getting him into quite a bit of trouble. David was then rescued by the X-Men while trying to flee the police. He later took the codename Hijack. Appropriate, I think. His powers have also been shown to be able to manipulate more tech than just vehicles. He can actually use them to defeat sentinels and even interfere with technological armor. Not a mutant that Iron Man would like to go up against then. Although, Iron Man is a bit of a technopath himself now. Hmm. I wonder who would win in a fight, but I think my money's still on hijack. His technopath powers seem stronger. Come at me if you think Iron Man would win, but I don't know. Number 7. Forget Me Not Propositional existentialism incarnate. To be or not to be? That is the question. With Forget Me Not, you can actually never be quite sure. Although, you probably would be more inclined to think that he didn't exist. Not to be in this case. Or scratch that. To not even know who I was talking about when I asked your opinion on if he existed or not. Forget Me Not's mutant powers are that he is imperceptible. Meaning that no one even knows he's there or can sense him. This translates to technology. And this also goes beyond just the physical perception as well. Even telepaths struggle to take note of him. There are some weird exceptions to his power though. Like Phantom X claiming that he could always detect Forget Me Not for some reason. And Psylocke has been able to find ways to locate him within others' memories through absences and holes that he leaves behind. But even Xavier himself had to set a once an hour reminder in his mind in order to remember Forget Me Not. And he was one of the most skilled at remembering him, so apparently other than Phantom X though, who could just remember him because his senses are real good? I don't believe it. I think Phantom X is fibbing. He's just trying to sound cool. It's like I always knew he was here. I can see him right now. It's fine. He's overweight. Rude. Number 6. Gabrielle Kinney Gabrielle Kinney has been through a series of code names since her introduction in All New Wolverine in 2016. When Gabby was introduced, she got to play the role of Little Sis to another favorite mutant, X23, Laura Kinney, who had actually adopted the code name Wolverine in that series. She was the All New Wolverine, get it? See, Gabby is also a clone of Wolverines, which makes her part of a weird kind of clone family. Ergo, her powers are also similar to those of Laura and Logan's. She has bone claws and a healing factor and enhanced senses, but she also has a different ability than her predecessors. She cannot feel pain, making her an extremely tough mutant to go up against. Also probably be hard for her to know when she's like getting close to being defeated. She's like, I don't know, I can't feel it. Number 5. Rat King A play on the Pied Piper, this mutant villain has the power of Zoopathy, which allows him to control animals using music. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Zoopathy. Zoopathy, it's kind of a weird word. He is the son of the Morlock Piper, whom he shares abilities with. When it was revealed that he was controlling local animals in Central Park into doing his bidding, Nature Girl and iBoy joined together to put a stop to him, freeing the animals from his control. Thus ended the reign of Rat King. Although, he's still around, just chilling in his flip flops. Number 4. Trinary 
Trinary is another technopath. Her abilities allow her to control various pieces of tech within her line of sight. Similar to Hijack, this also includes, but is not limited to, sentinels. In fact, born and raised in India, after discovering her mutant abilities, she used them to steal money from the top five highest earning CEOs' accounts. She then transferred and divided that money up between all the working women of India. Is it weird that I kind of love that? Because I kind of love that. Very Robin Hood. This later led to her imprisonment, which she managed to escape. She also appeared in House of X, working alongside the team of Technopaths and Moira X, who worked on Project Sleeping Giant. Sleeping Giant was created to help monitor for the development of Nimrod tech, which would threaten mutant kinds and eventually humanity's own existence. Technopaths seem to be becoming more common in the mutant world, which I kind of love. It's like as our tech develops and grows, so too do those with powers surrounding it, who seem to be popping up more and more often. Trinary made her comic book debut in the X-Men Red series. Number 3. Maxime and Manon Maxime and Manon are kind of like a mutant duo, so I thought I'd include them together. They are twins from the future, whose mutant powers activated before puberty, so they're kids. In the future, they attended the Xavier Institute for Young Mutants. However, they were then kidnapped and brought back to the present, where they were brainwashed by a hob and used as evil little weapons. Scary weapons too, may, may I add. After being defeated, the two children were left in the care of Jean Grey. They had been good children before they were sort of corrupted, and it was believed that they could probably be redeemed. Their powers allow them together to severely mess with people's heads, telepathically. Maxime's powers allow him to manipulate people's emotions, while Manon can alter someone's memories. They both also possess some mind control abilities as well. A dangerous combination, as we saw in New Mutants Volume 3, Issue Number 4. If you haven't read that yet, go read it because it's, it's messed up. It's great. Number two, Shade. Darnell Wade became inspired by New York superheroes, and he decided to build his drag persona around this inspiration, taking the drag name Shade. Also, can I just uh, like say that I love that Shade is wearing like a bunch of pouches, <laughs> like as a sash. It's amazing. Shade longed to star in a drag competition show, but her dreams were dashed when her friend Spillin Tiana Taylor was chosen over her to compete. To add insult to injury, Tiana also spurned Shade on national television, ending their friendship. Shade returned to her apartment with the power had just been turned off, and it felt like she. Had, well, hit rock bottom when her mutant powers manifested. Shade's powers allow her to teleport herself and others to the Dark Force dimension. Since her introduction in Iceman Volume 4, she has taken the alias of Dark Veil. Vale. Number 1 Gwenpool. Gwenpool has recently been retconned as a mutant. Due to her self awareness of the world around her, she was able to alter her origins. In Gwenpool Strikes Back Volume 5, she uses her reality altering powers to rewrite her own story and make herself a mutant, which Kamala Khan claimed had been the truth all along, and she had just blocked it out as a coping mechanism, making up the world of comics, which in truth was Gwen's real world. This allowed Gwenpool to move through a portal to Krakoa. Once there, she was welcomed by fellow mutants, including her ex, Quentin Quire. She even gave herself a House of X slash Powers of X style character breakdown in one of the final pages of this issue. I guess we'll see if this ends up sticking, but for now at least, it seems Gwenpool has joined the mutant ranks. And what a time to be a mutant! If there was ever a time I would want to jump into that world, it would be now. Or the 90s. When of course I could have all the pouches. Give me all the pouches. That's all I want in my costume. Oh. Number 10, Red Goblin. Red Goblin is the amalgamation of the Carnage symbiote, combined with Norman Osborn's Green Goblin. When you mix a blood fused symbiote like Carnage together with the insane Green Goblin, you get Red Goblin, a pretty fearsome foe to be reckoned with. Spider Man had to renounce his mantle to protect his family and fight Red Goblin as Peter Parker, and had to also call in backup to defeat this epic version of Norman Osborn introduced a few years back. This whole experience as well severely messed with Norman's mind and later resulted in him believing that he was in fact Carnage aka Cletus Cassidy and was not at all Norman Osborn forgetting all about that life until another mysterious villain Kindred gave him back his sanity. Thanks Kindred, that's so nice of you. Number 9. Kindred. Kindred is the Spider-Man villain who was first introduced in the 2018 series of Amazing Spider-Man in issue 1. Kindred itself is a demon from hell who used to be human and seems to have had a close relationship with Peter Parker in life. However, what we didn't know for a long time was just who Kindred's true identity was. We simply knew the villain wanted revenge on Pete and on Norman Osborn, and that they had demonic powers in addition to having two pet centipedes, which Kindred often uses to assist them and do their bidding. Recently, Kindred's true identity was revealed to be that of Harry Osborn, but some fans are still hesitant to take this reveal at face value, believing it could be a misdirect and that we may still not yet know Kindred's true identity. So 
many people have so many theories. And before we move on to our number 8 spot, just a reminder, if you love us like we love you, show it to us by giving this video a thumbs up. And thank you for doing so. Number 8. The Griever at the End of All Things So, I always want to call this villain the Griever at the end of the universe, but that must be because I'm a huge Hitchhiker's Guide fan, and that's just uh, bubbling back to the surface in my mind. But it's not the Griever at the end of the universe, it's the Griever at the end of all things. The Griever at the end of all things was a new villain who showed up and seemingly killed Molecule Man, proving how powerful and scary she was as early as her first appearance. I gotta say, I think her design is cool, but I'm kinda disappointed that she hasn't resurfaced in any Fantastic Four issue since her first fight with the FF team. The fight was so epic that the Fantastic Four actually had to call in a ton of backup, calling on temporary and rotating members of the team to join them, and finally revealing after the events on Battle World and the recreation of the multiverse that they actually weren't dead as all their fellow heroes were made to believe, but were actually alive and rebuilding everything in secret. So that let that cat out of the bag. Number 7. Apocalypse's Children Slash First Horsemen, I suppose. These kids are the ones who obviously inspired Apocalypse in the future when it came to naming and creating his horsemen thereafter. Their names are the same as those Apocalypse would normally take for his horsemen, war, death, famine, and pestilence. These children made their first appearance recently and then resurfaced once more extremely recently in the newest X-Men series. They hold a grudge against Apocalypse who they believe abandoned his family. They blame him for such, and while you might think that Apocalypse is a villain, so who cares, right now he is aligned with the other mutants of Krakoa, and as such is actually considered mostly a good guy? For now anyways. He did do some shady stuff, so not so nice Apocalypse. Or however we're saying your name now, Krakoan symbols with an A in the middle, however I say that in Krakoan. Number 6. Dark Carnage Dark Carnage is like Cletus Cassidy but dead, and brought back to life using the Grendel symbiote and then turned into a towering skeletal monster that is hungry for your spine. Well, maybe not your spine specifically. But if you bonded with the symbiote ever, alive or dead, he's hungry for that spine. It's finger licking good delicious spines. Dark Carnage was sort of the final phase of Cletus Cassidy who sought to awaken Null by gathering all the codices from within all those beings who had ever bonded with a symbiote. Doing so would awaken the Dark God, which was just the kind of chaotic party Cassidy was all about. And attempting to do this, he perished but was ultimately successful as Null is now awake and headed for Venom and Earth. Cletus may be gone as a result, but the villain has died many times and returned in many different incarnations, such as this new one, Dark Carnage. I'm excited to see if he comes back again, and when he does, just which version of Carnage we'll see next. Maybe some kind of dark immortal Carnage. Number 5. Orcus If you didn't already know me to be a big Marvel X-Men fan, then this list should solidify that as a thing for you. Yes, it is definitely a thing. I love the X-Men. Orcus is the new big bad for mutant kind introduced originally in the House of X series. House of X and Powers of Ten were the series that launched into this new wonderful X-Men line with Jonathan and Hickman at the head, Dawn of X. Orcus is designed to be kind of the ultimate mutant enemy. With mutants coming together and putting their differences aside, it also inspired their enemies, and even allies in some cases, to become wary of them and do pretty much the same. Orcus comprises multiple organizations, each comprising different percentages of the organization, including Shield, Sword, Alpha Flight, Hammer, Hydra, Aim, Armor, and Strike. When I did that, I almost lost my ring. Oh my goodness. Orcus's goal is to monitor and prevent the potential extinction of humans on the planet, and they see mutant evolution and advancement as a threat to that goal. Number 4. Horticulture Horticulture have to be some of my favorite of the newest villains and villain groups to surface. They are a group of elderly women and botanists who are focused on preserving the planet, focusing on returning it to a more pristine state. In other words, they want to make sure people stop messing everything up by taking control of everyone's food source, in essence controlling plant life and crops, in order to decide who gets to live and kind of who gets to die. As of right now, there are four women who are part of the group that we know of, Lily, Edith, Opal, and Augusta. They also made a brilliant and hilarious appearance in the limited Empire X-Men series, which by the way, if you haven't read, is pretty hilarious and great, and I do recommend it. You don't really have to read Empire to enjoy it either, you just need to know the general plot of that event to enjoy the story of this four issue series featuring my fave new villains, Horticulture. Number 3. White Sword White Sword was one of the mutants who was part of the original mutant nation of Okara, which Apocalypse and his wife Genesis ruled. He was one of the leaders who was sent along with his army of 100 champions to defeat the Amenthi who attacked. 
He was believed to have been victorious, but was also lost to his people as a result. A healer capable of resurrection, he would revive his army daily to fight the Amenthi Horde the following day. It's said that this drove the White Sword somewhat insane, and when he later ran into his own people, such as Genesis, who herself had been sent out with a mutant army under her command, he saw even them as his enemy and he attacked, defeating Genesis. He will be one of the champions to fight on the side of Arako, opposing Krakoa, in the Ten of Swords tournament. He also happens to look similar to Apocalypse, but with different armor. Maybe you don't see that, but I definitely see that. Number 2. The Viscora The Viscora are a mysterious alien race that made a brief appearance in Cable Volume 4 Issue 5 as part of the Ten of Swords event. We run into them on the Sword Headquarters space station known as Peak 7. It seems the Viscora swiftly invaded Sword's orbital HQ and within 10 minutes had pretty much decimated almost the entire crew. We know this from the log featured in the issue. Those few surviving crew had no other option but to completely shut down the station's power in order to prevent the Viscora from progressing any further with their invasion. To prevent anyone from potentially awakening the station or the Viscora, they didn't send out any SOS calls at the time of powering everything down, and essentially just kind of disappeared. Opal Luna Saturnine was the one who compelled Cable and his parents, Marvel Girl and Cyclops, to awaken the station once more. Though her motives remain unknown, it's speculated that she wanted to harm the family to help prevent Cable and possibly all mutants from being able to enter the Otherworld tournament, although her motives are still very foggy in my opinion. The Viscora seem obsessed with cleansing, dissecting, and learning of any alien life forms. In other words, they pretty much want to kill everyone. Number 1. Donald Blake Thor issue number 9 of the newest run from 2020 starts off a new story arc titled Prey. At the end of the issue, we see the return of Donald Blake, a former persona of Thor's who basically became his own person but then was trapped in a hell dimension. Driven mad, Dr. Donald Blake has returned, escaped his prison, and seems to be looking for revenge on all of the gods. This this is a refreshing and interesting take on an old character, bringing him back as a villain now. It's what I really find intriguing about this new run on Thor, which I thought was maybe going to be trying to take us back to ones with, you know, the title character himself and everything else. And yet we have amazing things like this happening. Donald Blake returning to us not as the same old, same old ally, but as a villain. Shortly after escaping, Dr. Blake is confronted by Loki, so that's the god that he deals with first. Surprisingly, Blake makes quick work of of Loki, vowing that he will no longer be a refuge for any god ever again, and they will no longer be able to hide from him. Thor, I think he's coming for you. I think so. Starting us off in at number 10, Mercury. Let's begin our list with a mutant who debuted in August of 2003, in New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 2. Mercury, aka Cecily Kincaid, has the ability to mimic Mercury, hence her code name. Her body is made up of a non-toxic metal that resembles mercury and she can reshape it or solidify at will, despite still being relatively inexperienced in shapeshifting. She can cling to solid surfaces thanks to her molecular adhesion powers and has exhibited super strength at times, although the full extent of that strength is still undetermined. Now she doesn't require food or water, although she does eat to make herself fit in better with others. She ended up being selected by Emma Frost to be part of her Hellion squad, along with a few other of her fellow teenage pals at the Institute, including our next number in at 9, Rock Slide. Rockslide aka Santo Vaccaro first debuted in 2003's New Mutants Volume 2, Issue 3, in September of that year. He is a mutant with the ability to transform into a golem form, which he does by assimilating surrounding rock and earth into a gestalt shell, which he can also detonate at will to cause an explosion. Now, this form gives him superhuman strength, durability, and endurance. After traveling from his home of Boston to live at the Xavier Institute, he began to befriend the soon-to-be Hellions, with Emma Frost selecting him to be a part of the Hellion squad. He's also got quite the fun personality. Santo dreams of being a superhuman wrestling star. Initially he was portrayed as a bit of a bully, but now the more that we get to know his character, the more that he's grown, becoming more good natured and fiercely protective of his friends. He also loves murder mystery television and Dan Sands Revolution. So he's pretty relatable. <laughs> It's also worth noting that he was one of the students who managed to retain his powers after M-Day. Moving on to number 8, Armor. Armor aka Hisako Akichi is a Japanese mutant who first appeared in October of 2004 in Astonishing X-Men issue 4. Her mutant powers are pretty rad. She has the ability to generate an impenetrable psionic exoskeleton body armor that gives her superhuman strength, reflexes, agility, endurance, stamina, dexterity, durability, and invulnerability. 
Not too shabby, huh? And her goal was always to become an X-Man, and she went through some pretty traumatic stuff while she was a student at Xavier's. After the alien villain Ord attacked the school, her best friend Wing had been injected with a cure for his mutant ability, and eventually he committed suicide because of it. With Armor, along with Kitty Pride and other students at the time, all being trapped inside the danger room with his reanimated corpse. That happened when the room became sentient and hostile towards them, so not a good experience for her, needless to say. In at number 7, Blindfold. Blindfold is Ruth Aldean, a character who first debuted in Astonishing X-Men Volume 3 Issue 7 in 2005, despite being mentioned several months prior in the same series as Issue 4. Now, she was created by Joss Whedon and John Cassidy, and she's got some wickedly powerful abilities. She's a telepath, is capable of retrocognition, clairvoyance, precognition, reality anchoring, astral projecting, and psychic energy manifestation. Over the years, she's had some other powers that she's lost or regained, including telekinesis, chaos manipulation, and accelerated problems. Ability. Now, ever since she was a child, Ruth has worn a blindfold over her eyes in order to cover up her mutation. She was born without eyes, but has powerful psionic abilities. Now, her powers are neutralized when she's in the presence of another precognitive, like Destiny, who explained that when two precogs are in close proximity to each other, it's like they're two magnets pressed together positive pole to positive pole, negatively affecting each other's powers. These days, after Dawn of X, Ruth's predictions about her future proved to be true. She knew that there would be a utopia for most mutants, but because of her precognition abilities and Moira McTaggart's demands that no precogs be allowed on Krakoa, she was not able to join her peers. And at number six, Bling. Roxy Washington is Bling. With an exclamation point. A mutant who attended the Xavier Institute and was a part of the X Men in Training Squad, first appearing in X Men Volume 2, Issue 171 in 2005. She's the daughter of a celebrity couple, two hip hop artists named Daddy Libido and Sexy Mother. And because of this, she had often been targeted by kidnappers or assassins because of her parents' fame. She had no desire to follow in her family's footsteps, and being a mutant who had a diamond form and superhuman durability, and an ability to project Diamond Shard's boot, she came to the Xavier Institute and was trained under Gambit under his squad. She's also bisexual and had a big old crush on Rogue. I mean, who doesn't? Aside from her genius powers, she's got a genius level intellect, she's a master engineer, and at one point she was recruited for Angel's board at Worthington Industries. She's also not overly caught up in the mutant human dynamic, she kind of prefers to just not deal with it. To each their own. And at number 5, Trance. Next up we have another mutant who debuted in 2005, Trance. Trance first hit the scene in New X-Men Academy X issue 12. Trance, whose name is Hope Abbott, is a mutant with a particularly interesting power. She has an energetic astral projective form in which she projects her astral self and can travel over far distances in this form, as well as avoid physical injury and can produce a disruptive energy surge. The first time her powers manifested in her hometown of Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, it looked as if a ghost had come out of her body and it actually gave her father a heart attack. She was then sent by her parents to the Xavier Institute in hopes of her being cured of this mutation. Culturally sophisticated and voted the best dressed by her classmates, Hope never really made the cut when it came to the formation of a new X-Men team, but she stayed at the Institute to train further. She has a decent amount of untapped power that she's yet to learn to control, like creating arcing energy surges that can stun foes, and bend metal or concrete. In at number 4, Grey Malkin. Jumping forward a few years for this one, let's talk about Jonas Gray Malkin, a character who first appeared in Young X-Men issue 1 in June of 2008. Jonas is quite old, narratively speaking. He was born in pre-revolutionary America and spent his youth coming to terms with his sexuality, having realized that he was gay. His father caught him with another boy one day in their family's barn, and believing that Jonas was an abomination and the spawn of the devil because he was super Christian, he beat Jonas to death. Or at least, he thought Jonas had died. His father buried him alive in the nearby woods, and this is what triggered Jonas' mutant powers, allowing him to survive around 200 years underground, which just so happened to be under the Xavier Institute. Turns out he's actually an ancestor of Charles Xavier's. Now, when a sentinel attack destroyed the school, he was unearthed. So, what exactly are his powers? It's something called darkness empowerment. It's related to light exposure. The darker it is, the more powerful he becomes. This includes giving him superhuman strength, nigh invulnerability, longevity, or potentially immortality on that front since he survived without food or water for 200 years, and of course, night vision. Moving on to number three, Transonic. 
Transonic, also known as Laura Tremette, debuted in July of 2010 in Uncanny X Men issue 526. She is a mutant with supersonic flight, capable of not only propelling her body through the air at transonic speeds, but also can change her physical properties in order to have better maneuverability in the air, which she does at higher altitudes or when traveling at high speeds. She's been able to make herself look like a large flying fish or a missile. When Laurie first appeared in Uncanny X Men, she was a blue teenager, quite literally having difficulty coping with her mutation. When the X-Gene manifested in her, it took no real form, but it caused her skin to change color, for her to lose her hair, and gave her flu-like symptoms. So she tried to commit suicide by jumping off a building, but in doing so, it actually activated her powers. Eventually she joined up with Hope Summers as one of the Five Lights, becoming a prominent character in the Generation Hope series. Now, Aside from her powers, she's an incredibly smart and thoughtful mutant, setting logic as the rationale for her actions, and getting annoyed at her teammates when they confuse things like ethics and morals. She's also Canadian, so. And at number two, Brandon Sharp. Brandon Sharp, also known as Stryker, first hit the scene in August of 2010 in Avengers Academy issue one. He has the power of electrokinesis, capable of generating huge amounts of electricity and then manipulating it. This includes creating lightning blasts from his hands and eyes, electromagnetic shields to use for defense, and he can propel himself into the air and fly via electrokinetic flight up to 40 miles per hour. Unfortunately, he is a bit of a twat. He is a self-centered and egotistical character who is focused on his own gain rather than helping others. Brandon had a bit of a rough upbringing though. His father was an adulterous politician and his mother was fame hungry who made him become a child actor. Brandon's manager, Rick, tried to take advantage of the young boy and that's where Brandon's powers first manifested, frying the limo that they were in and severely injuring Rick. And finally in at number 1, Velocidad. Gabriel Coelho is Velocidad, a mutant who debuted in 2010 in Uncanny X-Men issue 527. He's another Generation Hope mutant who is a part of the Five Lights with Hope Summers. And kind of also had a thing with her until she caught him making out with Pixie. Unfortunately, he met his end almost nine years later, dying in Uncanny X Men Volume 5, Issue 21. Now, Gabriel is capable of doing something called localized time manipulation. He can slow down the movement of time around him, but remains unaffected by that slowdown. So it does make him appear as if he's moving incredibly fast. But really, he's not a speedster, just a time manipulator, which is what everyone actually initially thought his powers were. Now, his powers speed up his aging greatly, though, which is what happened after he was detained and forced to use his powers for ONE, the Office of National Emergency. He was merged with Warlock in order to keep him alive, and eventually when Wolverine came across him, he asked Logan to kill him, which the mutant did in an act of mercy. Told you it didn't end well. <laughs> <laughs>